time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening. This is David Ross. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope, Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Mr. Bruce K. Brown, former chief of Petroleum Administration for Defense. Mr. Brown, it's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight, sir. You're a distinguished member of the oil industry and our viewers are interested in your problems. Now, first, sir, it's been in the news that the Turkish government has denationalized its oil resources, meaning that the Turkish government is going to turn over to private enterprise the problem of finding and developing its oil. Now, sir, uh, how do you regard this particular bit of news? Is it hopeful? Well, I think it's very hopeful <coughs> for the Turks. They have tried for 30 years through government bureaus to locate oil. I think they have 400 barrels a day. I guess the need, perhaps, local need of 15 or 20,000. Well, now, during the past uh, 20 years or so, the trend has been in the other direction, hasn't it? That is, more and more nations have nationalized their oil properties. Well, uh, I think that uh, any, any little spots on the curve make a trend, but after all, there only been two cases, well, Mexico and Iran. I think this will uh, have any... South American countries have nationalized it, but they didn't have any oil anyway. They just talked about it. Would this have any significance so far as the Middle East is concerned? Uh, there seems to be a trend toward nationalization there. In uh, other countries being more lenient about uh, their policy toward foreigners coming in producing oil. Well, of course, the Turks are building a civilization, and they use a lot of oil. Uh -huh. I imagine that's one of the things that affects their viewpoint. They have factories. They have automobiles. Uh, it's a little different to be oilless in a state of apparent uh, economic uh, advance and to be oilless when you don't have anything anyway. Do you anticipate that American com companies will now move into Turkey and help them develop their resources? <coughs> I think they will, yes. I think there'll probably be quite a lot of competition. Well, sir, now, uh, the oil industry occasionally has its problems with government, and our viewers would be interested in this, sir. Do you feel that the industry is being harassed at this time by the government of the United States? Well, not by the government as such. Uh, in the domestic scene, I think that the uh, uh, industry is getting along all right. I don't think they would have any reason for complaining. Abroad, the uh, state and the defense departments well, is there any agency of the government that is... Uh, well, uh, one that doesn't have any business uh, abroad at all, the Federal Trade Commission has been uh, uh, writing uh, naughty stories and circulating them. But what's, their what's their complaint against the American oil industry? Well, <laughs> I read the 370-page uh, report they wrote. Uh, they say that uh, the five companies, not the industry, but five companies joined with the British company and a uh, Dutch company to fix the prices of oil in the world. Was well, this an official report of the Federal Trade Commission? Mr. They uh, circulated it as such, although when they first circulated, no member of the commission had ever read it. It was written by the staff. How long was it held up before it was uh, issued? Well, they issued, uh, I don't know how many copies, but uh, I got number 45 in my official capacity, top secret mark. There might have been 100 for all I know. They issued that in December. It took until April to have it published after that, and I'm sure that they must have known anything they issued in as many copies would not remain. Do you, do you think that this is hurting the oil industry? <coughs> well, the report itself uh, condemned the oil companies as a bunch of, say, shall we say, buccaneers. And uh, it's very hard for foreign nations to distinguish between a uh, few economists and the Federal Trade Commission what they think of the oil companies and what, say, the President of Congress. Does. In other words, the foreign nations interpret it as an attack by the uh, government an official of the United attack States. by the official government of the United States, although no commissioner had ever read it. Well, do you think that's caused uh, American interests, oil interests abroad, much damage? In I know countries? it has. In what way? Well, it started a welter of uh, excitement in every uh, country of the world in which there was oil and which there were oil companies always along the same line. If the Americans think their oil companies are bad, they must be bad. 
Now, sir, you said this wasn't an official uh, report of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, who was responsible for, for preparing this FTC study? A st the, the staff members, the people who are employed as economists and lawyers to think up things. I see. One of the problems that most Americans, I'm sure, think of occasionally, we hear so much about foreign development of oil, in particular Middle East. What about what is our oil condition? Do we have enough oil for our own country within our own borders? I believe we do. Currently, we import about 10% of the oil that we use, uh, mostly, almost entirely from South America. But if they didn't have lush oil fields in South America, I think probably we would pr be producing it here. Well, are we fortunate enough that the Western Hemisphere is uh, sufficient uh, for, as far as oil is concerned? Completely self-sufficient, Mr. Hoy. The whole, uh, for years and years, so far as I can see, the well, Western Hemisphere. How does this reconcile with a statement that I heard uh, some petroleum authority make the other day? And he said he thought that there would be a good chance if the United States lost its Middle East oil of uh, Americans having to go on gas rationing. Well, that comes, I know what he means. Uh, the, the European nations are almost totally dependent now on Middle Eastern oil. If they lose the <coughs> Middle Eastern oil, and if we still wish them as allies and try to support their economy, I think the man must mean that we would share our oil with them. And if we tried to share it, it would be pretty tough. Do you think there's any chance of us losing Middle Eastern oil? Not if we uh, behave uh, with uh, the intelligence of 16-year-old children. Well, sir, now a new administration is coming in on January the 20th. And uh, does the oil industry think that, uh, wh what do you expect of this new administration? Well, uh, of course, I can't speak for the industry. Uh, as an individual, and, and I hope an informed individual from the industry, my own feeling is that the new administration will be less belligerent towards business generally than the past administration. But I don't look for any particular change as far as oil is concerned. On this program recently, we've had people who talked about the uh, great developments that are coming in atomic energy. Now, any of our viewers who may be employed by the oil industry, do you think there's any danger of <coughs> anybody in the oil industry losing his job in the I next few years? I hope they are worried about it. And that doesn't mean that I don't believe that atomic energy may not be developed. But after all, uh, less than 20% of our oil is used to generate power in for, for lights and heat. And the first development, and the only one I can visualize, will be for that. I can't conceive of 50 million separate atomic energy plants and automobiles. Automobiles would be too costly. Well, gasoline uh, is, is pretty expensive. Uh, some of us find it that way. And uh, wh what about, what's the prospect as to gasoline and oil prices? Are they going up? Oh, I'm sorry, sir, to, to have to correct you, but gasoline itself doesn't cost me more than 27 years ago. 27 cents a gallon, at uh, 10 cents a gallon at the refinery, 27 years ago and today. What's going up is taxes. Oh, I see. You, you, you're telling me now that, that, that the price of gasoline at the refinery is the same no. today as it was 27 years yes. ago? Inflation hasn't affected it, in other words. Not as you, well, I don't know. I think it would have gone down, probably. Yes, had without inflation. inflation. Uh, everything costs more than it did. Yeah. Well, I don't think the chances are too good for <coughs> a drop in price, and I don't think the chances are too good for a drop in tax. Now, uh, the gallon of gasoline it may cost 30 cents. Only 10 cents of that is the uh, price is the cost of but gasoline the at, the, at, for it. At, at the refinery. The rest of it's taxes and transportation. Are, and we de man. <coughs> are we depleting our oil reserves at a very fast rate? Is there any chance of us running out of oil, say, within the next 10 years? No, sir. No. We are finding each, each year more oil than we use. A great deal has been said about the big oil strike in the Dakotas. Do you expect a lot of activity in that area? Yes, I think we'll be in increasing activity for years. <coughs> it will be years, however, before uh, it is developed uh, to where it's as big an oil province as, say, Louisiana or California. Well, uh, on this program last week, I recall, uh, we had some discussion of the vast industrial development of Canada, including its oil de development. Now, uh, what about Canadian competition? Do you think that will affect the industry adversely? No, I don't think it will adversely. After all, there's a very narrow line that you can't find between uh, Montana and Alberta. The Canadians are using more and more oil. They're only producing a third of what they need now. What do you think about synthetic oil developments? Uh, in case we, after many, many years, did run out of oil, could we produce it synthetically? Yes, sir. So there would we be plenty of oil. We could do it today yes. if, if the economics required it. 
Well, are we still looking for oil? Is, uh, is wildcatting <laughs> for oil going on widely in the United States now? Yes, sir. There, uh, until uh, a month or two ago, we always experienced a slump this time of year. There were more teams out looking for oil and more uh, drills working, drilling holes in the ground than ever before. Well, now, is that to carried on principally by individuals, that wildcatting, or is it done by the major oil companies? Well, uh, I would say principally by an intermediate group. Uh, the major oil companies do a, a lot of exploratory work, drill a lot of wells, but the majority <laughs> of the discoveries have, have been by smaller groups, but not individuals. I mean, small companies or syndicates of several people. Well, there's a final question, Mr. Brown about the people who work in the oil industry. Uh, how does their standard of living, their weight scale, compare with coal and steel and rubber and the other big uh, segments of industry? It's uh, much better than, uh, than uh, coal. It's much better than steel. I'm not too well informed on rubber. It's quite a high wage. Uh, approximately what is the average hourly wage well, uh, in the in refineries today. In, re in the refineries, uh, I don't know as I give you an average, but I'll give you a typical one of a modern refinery, around uh, $2.15, uh, maybe $2.20 an hour. And do you have the same situation that you That's have in other industries? Do you have the industries organized, and also do you have the is labor organized, too? You have the big union and big industry? We have several different types of unions in the oil industry. We have AFL, CIO, and independent, but we do not have the big industry of steel. I mean, the negotiations by the companies have been independent. Well, thank you very much for being with us this Great. evening, sir. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight are entirely their own. The editorial brought with this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Hardy Burt. Our distinguished guest was Mr. Bruce K. Brown, former Chief of Petroleum Administration for Defense. This charming matron in furs and flounces with a Longines watch hung from a chain round her neck serves to remind us that this coming holiday is counted as Longines 86th Christmas. This year more people throughout the world will receive Longines watches than ever before. More important, however, the Longines watches now at your jewelers are the finest ever produced. And each one is worthy of the highest honors which Longines have won. Ten World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and countless prizes for accuracy from government observatories. Every Longines watch is superlative in style, superb in finish, and unsurpassed for faithful timekeeping. A Longines watch is indeed the gift of great prestige. And unbelievably, you may buy and proudly give a Longines this Christmas for as little as 7150. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at the same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is David Ross, speaking for your regular host, Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Challenging Entertainment, Omnibus, on the CBS Television Network.